Hello, welcome everyone to our High Tech Tuesday on Administrative Monday. Glad to see you all here. Um, this is uh, Linda Thayer. So yes. Say it. She's from Pennington Henderson, and she's going to be speaking on the NTP versus RIM case, which I know we're all very interested in since we know we'll have blackberries when we get to be attorneys. We don't have them already. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to let you go ahead and get started. Uh, Ms. Rock, who usually does our introductions, is looking frantically for the um, stuff that uh, Finnegan sent us in the mail. Um, so hopefully it'll get here some information about their firm and some water bottles. But um, if it doesn't get here, we're going to hand it out next week. So come back. All right, great, thank you. So welcome. Uh, hopefully I will do this topic justice today. It's something that I've been following for um, a couple of our clients. I'm sure you've all heard a little bit about it through the news. And one of the reasons why I agreed to talk about it today is because it's a timely topic and newsworthy since the, um, the hearing on the preliminary injunction is going to be Friday. So Friday's sort of D-Day or, or another big D-Day for both parties. And um, I, I, one of the things I'm going to talk about today or what I'm going to, my plan is today is to sort of take you through the case, how it, um, how it started, some of the milestones along the way, and set you up so that when the decision is, comes down on, um, on Friday, you'll have a little background as to um, what was going on. How many of you are uh, either have had patent, ca patent courses or are interested in patent law? Is there, oh, you guys all have, that's great. <laughs> that's great, are, do we have any registered patent attorneys here? Or patent uh, agents, I guess, yet? <laughs> Great. And um, did any of you intern or, or do your summer last year at a patent law firm or have work experience in patent law firm? That's great. That's great. I just like to get a gauge the audience a little bit so that I know uh, what level of terminology to be I'll use throughout the um, the talk. And if any of you, if I if I start to say something that is uh, making your eyes glaze over, well, <laughs> let me know. But I I probably won't because I've kept it kind of high level. Um, well, this, this, uh, this case is near to dear to my own heart because I, too, am a BlackBerry user, um, a relatively newer BlackBerry user, but the legal community does, does use a lot of BlackBerrys. Uh, the, um, so I am curious as to, to what's going to happen. But this case it has raised actually a lot of legal issues and has patent attorneys um, discussing the case for a lot of different reasons. I think this case has, um, is, is uh, the epitome or has raised again the issue of um, uh, the general discussion of little guy versus big guy. Uh, Val is um, Campana the, um, the patent holder? Is NTP, who is essentially a um, licensing house, meaning they don't make products, they just have the patents assigned to them, and they're just a, uh, a couple-person entity that is, exists solely for the, uh, solely for the purpose of, of, um, of asserting patents and getting licensing fees. You know, is, and how do we, uh, is that how we want the world to be? Do, uh, versus RIM, which is a big international company, and they um, obviously make a product that the public finds very useful. So this raises a question of who should prevail in these kind of contests. Is it just enough to have a patent, and should you be able to, uh, should you be able to enforce it, even if it means that you, uh, you get $450 million for your invention and or you have the potential to stop an entire industry uh, by asserting your patent? And the, the reason I say valid inventor or patent troll is because um, patent troll is a term used by um, some in the industry. They, they're looked down on somewhat, the people that file patents purely f with the hopes of, of um, exerting the, it's sort of like winning the lottery, writing a lot of patents, filing patents, and, and maybe hopefully their patent will be enforceable against a company that has actually spent R&D money, actually developed a product, actually spent money um, making its technology acceptable or industry standard, and a, a patent troll, so to speak, hopes to just get the big payoff by uh, patent litigation and not necessarily by, um, by development in the field. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this, this case is also 
is also has people talking about the larger issue of the value of patent litigation. Um, does it actually help or hinder the development of technology? Is it good for the public? Um, is it good for the U.S. economy? And if we have a case like this that threatens to shut down the, um, the use of blackberries. And um, this, is a, this is more a, a topic that is this important and, and discussed mostly by people in the, in the patent field, but should patentees be able to get injunctions, preliminary injunction, which is going to be decided on Friday? Um, an injunction means the patent holder can sort of, uh, the, the court can order the company that's making an infringing product to stop uh, making the infringing product. And the reason why this is a question, and I'll get into it more later, is because um, the, the question is, if, a, if an entity such as NTP can be fully compensated by, uh, the, by money, so for a percentage of the sales, why do they need an injunction? Why not let the, um, the in, so to speak, infringing company continue to make the product and just make them pay damages in the form of money to the injured party, which in this case is, is the patent holder or NTP? I mean, why should they have or why or should we consider injunctions in this case, in the case of um, where damages might reasonably con compensate the patent holder? So first, um, just a little bit of background about the, the inventor and how these patents came to be. The main or the first named inventor is Thomas Campana. Um, he actually, it, he, this is all taken from uh, NTP's briefs. So this is NTP's view of the facts, but it's pretty much the, um, the, what, what I've read in a number of articles and don't know the man personally, uh, but he does, um, he, oh. I'm missing a colon. He, he was an engineer since grade school. There's a lot written about how he's invented a lot of things. He does have over 50 patents and a tech degree. Um, early on, th some of the early history is that he did found a company called ESA that was working in the field of, um, of paging and that he actually uh, had um, an agreement with AT&T in the early days of paging and uh, was working to develop a new paging system um, and uh, back w before these patents were written. Some believe that these patents do not necessarily cover the push technology of, of, of patents, but were written to, that's probably another uh, topic that I should have put at the beginning, but some, one of the discussions is if you write patents with a certain technology in mind, should you be able to enforce them against a new and emerging technology that you, you really couldn't have contemplated when you wrote the patent, but it just so happens that later they fall within the claims of the patents. There's some people that, that, uh, that think that his work was centered not necessarily on the push technology of Blackberries, but rather more with the uh, paging technology in mind, and that for that reason he shouldn't sort of hit the jackpot by the mere fact that the new push technology falls within the claims. But he did do early work. He, he, um, he was a very um, technical guy. He did do the early work with AT&T in the field of, um, of paging. So to, <clears throat> and in 1990 is when the development along, th that early development along those lines uh, stopped. AT&T dropped the project. The company that he had funded, ESA, went bankrupt. Um, so he, but he did have the patents. He did uh, gain the right to the patents from the company. Um, and so in 1992 is when he formed NTP with another guy who happens to be a patent agent, patent attorney. Anybody know what year Blackberries were introduced? First year there were Blackberries on the market? Guess, anyone? Oh, come on, give or take a year. Early, very, very early. Actually, 1999. I didn't realize that either. I had to look it up. But um, so he forms the, the licensing company in 1992, and then he starts looking for people who make a technology that, um, that fit within the claims. 1999, BlackBerry comes out. By 2000, it's starting to gain speed. It looks very successful. So they approached him about licensing, and Rim said no. So NTP hired attorneys and filed the lawsuit that started this in 2001. There are, um, initially there were seven patents involved in the lawsuit. There's now only five. 
Initially, they asserted 71 claims, which is a lot of claims. Uh, for those of you interested in patent litigation, you need to find infringement of only one claim of one patent in order for you to be entitled to, uh, uh, to call that a win. So he, uh, they have seven patents or, and 71 claims. He wanted to make sure there was something left standing. Uh, the earliest patent was, uh, had an issue date of July 1995. The technology, as I said, involves uh, push technology. Does anybody know what the push technology means as opposed to uh, the other technology? The, the part of the reason why uh, Blackberries are so successful is because the email is delivered to the Blackberry without anybody doing anything. In conventional desktop systems, it's assumed that the desktop is going to be connected to a system continuously, but whereas with wireless devices, you can't assume that because you're going to go in and out of range, you might turn it off. Um, so what, what um, the, the push technology, however, works by queuing your emails in a um, um, in an email server or pushing them out to your email server so that when you turn it on, they immediately download. Does anybody have BlackBerry here, just a person on BlackBerry? So you know as soon as when, it, when you turn it on, it spends a few minutes getting them all. Um, they were, um, yeah, they were queued at your email server and then when you turn it on, it got them. Um, otherwise, they are pushed as soon as they are received by the email server. <coughs> So um, anybody familiar with the general timeline of a patent litigation? First of all, this, um, this lawsuit was filed in the Eastern District of Virginia, which uh, some of you who have worked in a patent law firm may have uh, come to recognize as the, the, the rocket docket because the Eastern District of Virginia is known to have one of the, the fastest timelines from uh, start to finish of a patent litigation. Average patent litigation, you know, takes about three years. Here in the Northern District of California, three years is, is, a, is a normal timeline. Uh, but there's some jurisdictions which are, have enacted either uh, specific or uh, Patent, law, patent litigation rules designed to accelerate patent litigation, um, or they're just known to have a court system that doesn't want cases lingering, and one of them is Eastern District of Virginia. Um, one of the things that happens very early in a patent litigation is uh, claim construction, because the, the scope of what is well, whether a device is infringing the claims of a patent is determined entirely by the claims in the patent. So one of the first things that um, you do is to construe the claims, which means sort of agree or um, fight over what the claims really mean. And um, most patent, <coughs> the, the, how the claims are construed is determined by, um, there's a famous case, um, the Markman case, so, uh, which determines how claims should be construed. And so often the, there's a um, sort of a mini trial where the parties each present to the court how they think the terms and the claims should be construed. And then there's a... Um, um, sort of a mini trial where the court hears evidence and then the court comes out with an order that tells the parties how they should construe the claims or what the definitions of the, of the claims will be for this particular litigation. And so this, the claims in this case were construed way back in uh, August of 2002. That's when the Markman order came out. And as in most patent litigations, after the claims are construed, that's when the parties have a good idea as to where the case is going to go. In this case, uh, many of the claims were dropped because the way the court ordered the parties to, constru to construe the claims meant that some meant RIM could not be infringing some of them. And so those were dropped. And, um, but then, of course, once there's a uh, definition, um, NTP moved for summary judgment for uh, infringement on the remaining claims, and RIM moved for invalidity of the remaining claims. At the hearing that occurred in October, um, RIM lost big time, as I say there. <laughs> They lost on, uh, the claims were found to be valid by the court, and they were found to be infringing. Um, so, <clears throat> or, or at least the motions for summary judgment. Wait, 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 wait. Not there, they weren't found to be infringement. They lost, their, their motions for summary judgment were not granted. 
So they went to jury trial, which started in November 4th, and it went a um, couple of weeks because the decision was the 21st. I don't have it in here. One of the one of the side lessons to be learned is if you review the um, the transcript from this from this trial is um, actually Rim hired a big law firm, went in with um, an expert that they had um, they were arguing invalidity, and they had an expert demonstrate a prior text messaging system, uh, the SAM software that was supposed to be from 1991. They had, um, and they actually did an in-court demonstration. However, it right there in front of the jury, in front of the judge, the opposing counsel noticed that the that the software that they were using during the demonstration was not dated 1991, but was dated much later. The judge became furious. The transcripts is is available. Told them right then and there <laughs> that the, well, he sent them out. He came back. He 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 talked to them. Uh, the the uh, attorneys for both sides, and then he came back and told the jury that Rim's ev evidence was fabricated and that it should be wholly disregarded on the issue of invalidity. And um, there's many people that actually think that this this sort of has... Um, no, you don't want to ever say that judges are biased in one way or another, but the, the worst thing you can do as a litigator is lose the confidence or the judge or the jury. And this is, um, this is a case where Rim, RIM's counsel uh, sort of really lost big time because here you have, uh, in credibility-wise, uh, here you have, you're sort of caught with, um, with software and that was um, not good evidence, something you should have known beforehand. And many people think that the judge is now still mad after all these years is the best way to put it because many of the subsequent decisions are um, just coming down for NTP one right after the other. And the jury did in fact reach a verdict in four hours and uh, prob probably at least in part because of the failed demonstration found that RIM had willfully infringed. Uh, the damages, they, they, um, they found damages in the amount of $23 million and uh, a royalty. They, there you go. The damages were enhanced because of RIM's fraudulent behavior and questionable litigation tactics. The judge then upped the damages to $53 million plus legal fees and upped the royalty and issued an injunction. So what happened after that? In the next several months, next about eight or nine months, the parties did file a number of motions um, that were fighting over how damages should be calculated. Um, you know, the, uh, what, it, the, there was a royalty involved, so many of the motions had to do with what component or what was it per use, how should the royalty be calculated. That went on for several months. Um, that, the damage award was finally finalized in August 2003. Coincidentally, RIM also requested re-exam of all the patents in June 2003, which was granted by the Patent Office in September 2003. Now, re-examination is a, a process before the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office where, and, and there's two types of re-exam. There's ex parte and there's third, part, uh, third party. In ex parte, anytime you are a patent holder, if you believe that uh, there, you be have become aware of prior art uh, that may make your, or, or you may think is your patent may be invalid or something like that, you can go back to the patent office and ask that they re-examine it in light of new material that you give to the patent office. And that's one way of sort of retesting whether your, your patent is, um, is valid over this new art or this new material. In third party re-exam, if a third party finds that there's some, some prior art that you did not disclose to the patent office, then they can go to the patent office and say, you need to look at this patent. I don't think this patent is valid. There's some information that you should have considered and you didn't because you either didn't know about it or you didn't fully appreciate the material that was before you. Um, that's third party re-exam. So that's what NTP did. NTP actually filed with the patent office a lot of the same art that they had uncovered and had put in their motions for um, invalidity. So this is this is interesting because um, whenever you're whenever you're 
defending somebody accused of patent infringement, one of the first things you do is look to see whether the patent's valid because that's the defense. So as a matter of course, we hire a lot of experts, we do a lot of searching, and we go to, and um, if there's art that is not listed on the face of the patent, that, um, that is uh, art that the office did not consider. Because if the examiner looked at any piece of art while he was examining the patent, it's listed on the face of the patent. So what we're looking for is art that the office did not examine. There's a presumption of validity over the art that is listed on the face of the patent. So we go to look for stuff that is not listed on the face. And um, I'm sure that's what RIM did. And they found art that was put in their motions for invalidity, but they lost on that. The, the, the district court said that the, the art was, um, that there was, um, um, that the patents were not invalid over that. So I have not fully compared these, so, but I know that the, um, that the art that they submitted to the patent office is additional art over what was before the art before, but it is some of the same art that was in their motions for <laughs> invalidity. And here we have the patent office saying, agreeing to sort of take another look. And in fact, um, in, the, in subsequent months, you may have read that the patent office has rejected the patents over the same art that the district, found them, district court found them valid over. So that's a little bit of an interesting twist. Um, on August 29th, RIM appealed to the Federal Circuit because um, any uh, patent court decision uh, is always appealed to the Federal Circuit. Federal Circuit has j jurisdiction over um, federal patent cases. What were the issues on appeal? Well, one of the issues was claim construction. How did the district court uh, construe the claims? Were the definitions that the district court ordered them to uh, uh, construe the claims, were, the, were those the valid ones or whatever? You can always appeal the claim construction to the Federal Circuit. Another side issue is whether um, uh, this is a, um, if you, maybe you remember this from patent class. I certainly don't remember it from patent class. <laughs> But um, whether a um, patented invention is an infringement under 271A if a component or step is located or performed abroad. Now, the reason why RIM uh, appealed this issue is because some of the claims that are involved in the litigation are method claims. So method claims are phrased that you are infringing if you perform all the steps of the method. So, you know, a method of uh, sending email by sending this, receiving it here, storing it here, and displaying it on a browser. That's a method claim. A um, system claim would be an apparatus that has various components. And um, a, uh, the method claims have to be uh, all of the, the issue was, do all of the steps have to be performed in the United States for you to be infringing? Because RIM argued that one of the steps of the claims, like um, s at least one of the steps, for example, um, uh, queuing the, the, the um, they have a network operations center, center in Canada because they're based in Waterloo, Canada. So one of their servers is where the step of one of the methods is performed. And in fact, um, the Federal Circuit did say that since one of the steps of the method claims was performed outside the United States, that infringement was not proper of those claims. So that's how s some of the claims and some of the patents were removed from the, um, the lawsuit. The district court, the Federal Circuit uh, affirmed the construction of all of the terms that were put before the district court except the definition of originating processor. So rather than, um, so it, since it did not agree with the construction of originating processor, it returned the entire suit back to the district court to consider the effect on validity and infringement of the new definition, that they, the new construction. That was in, um, when was that, the decision? Oh, I didn't put that. Forgot when the Federal Circuit, I think the Federal Circuit decision was at the end of 2004. Um, but then you may have heard this, that in March 2005, NTP and RIM agreed to a settlement. And um, this, they agreed, NTP settles for, or I should say RIM settles for $450 million. 
they had agreed to a settlement in in uh, in a settlement agreement, but they had not finalized the settlement, and uh, uh, they. Um, in fact, they proposed the, the settlement to the court. The, uh, oh, that should say unenforceable, I'm sorry. The terms of the settlement, the judge ruled were, were um, unenforceable, and they denied RIM's mo the, the court denied RIM's motion to stay proceedings pending the outcome of the re-exam. At this point, NTP, the patent office, had already rejected some of the claims, and so RIM was now arguing how, you know, that there's this inconsistency between the district court arguing that, or district court finding that the patents are valid and the patent office finding that the patents are not valid, or at least there's some question as to their validity. This is, I put that quote at the bottom from Judge Spencer because um, it just shows his mindset. Uh, he basically, at every turn, has taken the opportunity to move the case along. He's, he's made a number of comments that show he, he has disdain for um, delay tactics, for anybody that, for, for any um, action by RIM that is, that holds the case up by filing motions for stay or by the, the whole, um, the whole fact that they filed for re-exam. Um, I think he takes a little bit of offense to, um, although it is something RIM's entitled to do, but all of his comments show that he really wants to move this case along and get it out of his court. And he's the one who's going to be deciding the injunction on Friday. Um, so at the current time, let's see, they, so now we have this big standoff. Uh, there's no settlement at the current time, and in fact, it looks like RIM is is basically holding out. They're three days away from a um, a uh, hearing on um, injunction, and there doesn't seem to be any movement for um, any further settlement. At least I didn't hear of any today. It seems logical that RIM now is not eager to license uh, or to take a license because the last time I, I heard some dollar amount uh, offered, the NTP had gone up over like a billion or something, some, some very high dollar amount. So um, yeah, right now they know that the USPTO has rejected the patents um, and they are in re-exam and it looks like they're in, um, uh, the re-exam will probably play itself out over the next couple months where the claims will be. Excuse me, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this, maybe I missed it, but uh, can you explain the reasons why a judge would not enforce uh, a settlement that has already been, a settlement agreement that has already been reached by both parties? Yeah, I can't say with um, specificity related to this one why he didn't enforce that one, but the um, the parties do come t with they agree to specific settlement terms like a con contractual terms and then they do present it to the court for um, approval and I don't know why he did he, I I can't answer that actually because in this particular case I don't know why he found the terms to be unenforceable. Uh, if you want to leave me your email address, I'll answer that question by email, but I don't know in this case why he found the, the case to be unenforceable for the settlement agreement. Um, this, um, the re-exam before the patent office, however, is, is going to go on for a long time. Uh, the, when I checked them recently, they are finally rejected, but there were some uh, responses that were scheduled to be filed in the next month or so. Uh, even if they're finally rejected, that both parties appeal the decision to the Board of Patent Appeals and Interferences, and that could delay things before the Patent Office for another couple of years. And then if there's final decisions by the Board, those can then be appealed to the Federal Circuit. So in terms of the status of the patents through the Patent Office route, we're still a couple of years of, away from them being um, uh, uh, officially and finally uh, ruled invalid, or um, I should say taken taken back out of re-exam. Uh, the Supreme Court, mm, that should be a capital C, <laughs> the Supreme Court did reject um, NTP's, or I'm sorry, RIM's request for um, appeal of the um, 
most recent issues. February 9th, RIM announced that it does have a workaround as a backup plan. I don't know if any of you read what the workaround was, but I read their paper and their announcements, and they don't really offer any technical details as to how they're going to do it. It does, they just say that they're now starting to ship models with multi-mode addition, which will have a, um, a standard mode that they can use if the injunction, if, there, if there's no injunction granted, and a U.S. mode, which they can use. Um, if, um, if there is an injunction and that they will be able to sort of beep uh, or send a, a send a signal wirelessly to the ones that you buy now. But that does not mean that anybody who currently owns a BlackBerry, including myself, um, does not have this, this new multi-mode edition software on there. Our law firm would have to, um, to, to get it from them and, and install it um, before, before that would be a workaround. So that... It would still affect a lot of people. Um, they, as, I, as I said earlier, this has raised a lot of uh, people have been discussing whether or not there should be a junction, an injunction in this case, whether one will occur and, or whether there should be one. And um, just to review the, the standard for getting an injunction, in order for there to be one, you need to, the, the patent holder, has to show that there's reasonable likelihood of success on the merits, which mean that uh, when you're asking for one the first time, you have to show that there is, in fact, patent infringement. Well, this is easily settled because there's already been uh, a finding of patent infringement by, by RIM at the, in the district court. You have to show that there's, there would be irreparable harm if the injunction is not granted. And this is one of the prongs that's, uh, you know, it... Uh, companies usually argue that they are losing um, significant market share such that they would never be able to recover their standing, like to, and be, that they would never be able to make a competing uh, product because they would get so far behind in market share that they could never, never recover that ground. In this case, however, NTP doesn't make a product. And as we said at the beginning, their, their only harm is the fact that they're not collecting maybe license fees that they're entitled to during the, the period of, of um, infringement. However, that can be retroactively cured by ordering, you know, RIM to pay damages. So I don't know uh, why they found um, um, injunction in the, in the first part. Uh, the court also does a balance of hardships. What, what would, who would, uh, who would have the greater hardship the, um, the patent holder, if the uh, infringement was allowed to continue, or the uh, infringer, if injunction was granted, and the public at large. This is how um, the, the, last, the last criteria is, would the injunction have a favorable impact on public interest? And the last criteria is when, in the cases where injunction is granted, it's because they, they say that it's in the public's best interest to keep the patent, uh, the patent system going by, uh, by enforcing injunction against infringers because there's this huge public interest in, in keeping a viable patent system by having people know that if they infringe a patent, then there will be an injunction. There's some people that believe that, um, or it's, it's, the argument is made, that if you don't have the threat of an injunction, that infringement will just go willy-nilly, that people will infringe all the time because they will just say, oh, I'll just wait and see if I'm successful, and if I'm successful, then I'll just pay damages, and that we would actually have more, infri more infringement. So that is actually a question, though, that's going to be... Um, yeah, exactly. So in this, I'll, I'll follow up with that point in a minute. But in this case, as we said earlier, you know, should there be an injunction if NTP can be fully compensated through uh, royalty payments? Uh, you probably have heard that in the issue of public policy and on the balance of harms, the U.S. government has taken the uh, unique position or, or stance, and they have filed papers that are going to be heard on Friday saying that, uh, that um, this closing down or shutting down Blackberries would have an adverse uh, effect on the national security because a number of um, government um, officials use Blackberries to communicate. And I, I kind of hope they're not using Blackberries to, uh, to discuss whether or not they, to, to push the button there because uh, <laughs> that just scares me somewhat. But the, um, 
but they have in fact entered a, an appearance with a brief that says that they, um, there, if there is an injunction, there should be a carve out of government employees. Now that raises it, or, or government, um, for government use of blackberries. That raises a whole other subject because what is government use? Is it use of a BlackBerry by a government employee? Is it use by, of a BlackBerry by someone communicating with a government employee? Is it, does it include government contractors? Does it include people who communicate with government contractors? Um, so that is, um, I think, um, RIM has argued that there, um, or NTP has argued that that kind of injunction with a carve out for government employees would be unworkable because you just can't, they wouldn't be able to, nobody would be able to tell where the carve out stops or the lines would be too fuzzy. Uh, the question is should the harm to the public, has, has Blackberry use become so prevalent that it's sort of along the lines of a telephone system or cell phone or, or a, you know, the water system or something. Would the shutting off of blackberries so affect the public that that's something that the court should consider. You know, keep in mind though that the whole uh, reason that the that their patents are granted is so that the patent holder would enjoy a certain right to exclude others from making the technology. Um, the, that question though is something that people debate when it, the, the patent holder is somebody that doesn't make a product themselves. The whole right to exclude others from making and using a product sort of was designed to give the patent holder um, a, a exclusive period to enjoy their own invention. Now, do we really need that right to exclude um, if you get some, um, if you can just be, the court can order an infringer to pay damages for that time period? And the whole, you know, one of the reasons that we have patents is to c encourage people to give their technology to the public by filing for a patent, getting it, um, and, uh, so, and giving it to the public in the form of a patent. Um, yeah, but then are the patents valid? It's a question that, um, you know, the, the district court has found they are. The patent office is so far saying that the claims that, um, that, uh, that these patents have are not valid. So, you know, that's an open question. Should there be an injunction imposed when there is this question? You know, that's the, um, uh, the big question. Uh, so what's going to be the outcome on February 24th? Anybody willing to take a guess? Do you think there, the court will grant an injunction or the court won't grant an injunction? Well, I don't know either. Um, <laughs> but I will give you just um, the prevailing wisdom at our firm, I think, is that the, this judge, although he has shown that he wants to uh, accelerate this case toward finality and although he has granted an injunction in in the past I think there is a reasonable chance that this time he won't grant an injunction mm -hmm. and the reason being is that the um, I don't know if you've heard about another case that's uh, uh, eBay versus uh, Merck exchange and that is another case that is dealing with the issue of preliminary injunction and these same questions. Now that case in the end of 2005 uh, was granted cert by the Supreme Court. So they're going to hear oral argument on eBay in March of 2005 with a decision expected on this very subject of is preliminary injunction proper or what, how should you determine what the, the criteria for when to issue a preliminary injunction is going to be the subject of oral argument in March and um, probably, which the Supreme Court will probably decide before uh, they leave for the summer. So by June, there's probably going to be uh, more guidance on whether there should be preliminary injunction. So I think many, there, there's many of us, and maybe this is why uh, RIM is also not too eager to settle and why the parties aren't making any movement, even in these three days before this, this hearing, which is when you often see movement. But um, uh, we think maybe that RIM is banking on this, this fact that this judge is going to sort of punt. He's going to say, um, in light of the fact, that it, it sort of gives him an out, because whereas if there had been no granting of cert, he would, he would be 
uh, pretty much required to go with the, he found for a preliminary injunction before, he would be required to find one again. But now he could sort of punt and say, well, the Supreme Court has granted cert and they are a higher body than I, so let's, let's stay this or table this and wait for that guidance. So um, uh, there's many of us that believe they, they, that that's what the judge will do. In any case, even if he does grant a preliminary injunction, uh, chances are that he would, um, or maybe he'll grant a preliminary injunction, but give a number of months for um, the injunction to go into effect, also accounting for the fact that there might be a decision in June. If he does grant a preliminary injunction, what RIM will be forced to do is file a motion for stay of the preliminary injunction as soon as possible, like the same day. And that motion for a stay would be heard by the Federal Circuit, who I think would be um, sympathetic to the fact that this issue is before the Supreme Court. So if they did file that motion, I think the Federal Circuit would stay the injunction. So I, I think that if I had to bet the House, I think blackberries will not go dark in the next few months, but I think it's a case that, that will be interesting to watch over the next several months. Any questions? Yes? Well, you know, that's an interesting question because uh, this is, I, the patent office um, has the first initial say. And it, it, what would happen if, for example, this case were still going on and then there was a final decision by the patent office, um, then the patents would be invalid and damages would stop accruing. You can't, the damages can't accrue while there is, um, well, if there's no patents to base the, the, the suit on. And once re -exam, in re-exam the patents are held to be invalid, they can't file other lawsuits, which is, which is why you know, we're watching the suit too, because we want to um, also make sure, just advise other clients on what their rights would be. But if, it, while, if the patents are um, invalid, they can't file suit against other people. It's, it's really... It's, it's interesting, though, because here's a case where there's already a damage award, and, and, and the re-exam would also be appealed to the board, has to go through appeal to the board and appeal to the Federal Circuit. And um, so, you know, I really can't even work through all the various trees as to how this is going to get resolved, because... Uh, and that's why I think RIM is, is delaying this and delaying this and delaying this because they want there to be a final decision or at least a more final decision in the patent office um, and then w they would have grounds to go back and say that the, that the decision should be overturned because the patents are, are, have been finally determined to be invalid. Um, the, um, the problem is... See, I think if it got to the Federal Circuit on appeal from, from the, the board, um, that would sort of trump the decision, uh, the prior decision. Because if you, if you file a motion for invalidity in front of the district court, um, the Federal Circuit only appeals, only looks at the case for error. It doesn't look at the, the invalidity de novo. It looks at only whether there's error. If the board then, the, pat, uh, the, the patent office and the board finds that the patents are invalidity and then it were, uh, that, that were invalid and then they were appealed to the Federal Circuit, um, the Federal Circuit then would look at uh, whether there was error in the invalidity decision and they might have to look at, go um, and the art before the patent office is, is there's more art and later art than there was, um, I believe, in the motions for invalidity. They've since found additional art that they've been giving to the patent office. So I think the 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 patent office's decision would be the one that would be um, 
the one ultimately sustained. And I think RIM is playing this out in part because they, they think they will ultimately be invalid. It's just, I can't tell you the timeline because I just don't know how, um, how the court, you know, whether there's going to be stays granted so that it reaches this place in, in this court or uh, the patent office or how long the patent office is going to take. The patent office has said that they want to accelerate this, but the patent office is not a uh, fast-moving um, entity. <laughs> And uh, there's no pressure on them they, to resolve anything in any particular timeline. So I, I, you really, I can never guess at how long the patent office will take to do something. And I don't know which case is going to get up to, um, which, which one is going to reach the, the last step in all the appeals first. And that, I, I just don't know that. Yes, yes, because if the patent office issues um, a patent and a court finds it to be invalid, then that is binding. Uh, but I don't have a lot of experience, to tell you the truth, of the cases where there's not a lot of uh, re-exams, there haven't been a lot of re-exams uh, filed, in it, and there haven't been a lot of re-exams where the outcome has been uh, different than the district court. Often, they come to the same conclusion. Here's a case where the court found it, that it was valid, and then the patent office subsequently finds that they're invalid, and that just doesn't happen all the time. Well, thank you all for coming.